Good afternoon. God is in the ark for September the 24th of 2022. We're just on the air now. <clears throat> Coming up on this weekend on uh, Sunday evening, the 25th, we begin the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, uh, where you're traditionally you're supposed to be certain that you've heard at least a hundred trumpet blasts. And they go to great lengths to make sure that all the blasts are heard in the temple, in the temple area, um, so that everyone Here's the call in the presence of God. Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets. So I don't have any, on my phone, I don't have any shofar blowing. So I'm just going to play, uh, okay, not that. Blow the trumpet in Zion, <laughs> sound the alarm in my holy mountain. So let's of victory sounds something like this, but I, I'll get better. <laughs> A 
Amen. Blow the trumpet. Blow Amen. the shofar. Yeah. Amen. So now I'll give, get to the... Uh, Days of Elijah. This is a favorite one to be accompanied by shofars.
blow the trumpet, declare his victory. Recently, I discovered that the word that's translated joy so often in the Old Testament is ruah. And one of the blasts of the shofar is called teruah. And it's teruah, teruah, teruah. And it's a blast of joy. It's to bring joy to your heart, to celebrate. So when you hear the blast of the trumpet, the long blast, you heard it once there, um, is a call to repentance and a call to assemble before the Lord. And the uh, blast with the ta-ta-ta-ta-ta is a uh, declaration of the victory. And for us as New Covenant believers, that's a the, <laughs> the declaration of the victory of Jesus over all the works of the enemy. Hallelujah. So we've been teaching for several weeks now uh, on seven things that you must believe so that you're not easily deceived. And they are, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. He led a sinless life. Number four, he died in an atoning death. Number five, he was dead, buried, and went to hell. Number six, he rose again the third day. And number seven, he is coming back. And today we're going to touch on, I mean, there's whole volumes of books, libraries full of books about his coming back and his return. So we'll just touch a little bit, a little bit that, that I believe the Lord gave me to share with you. So he's coming back. Now I'm going to start by or preface this by saying um, that this is an area where there's a great deal of confusion. Many have mixed up the scriptures that speak of his coming back for his bride, the church, the event we call the rapture, and his coming back, his second coming, we call the second coming, at the end of the seven years of tribulation to set up his kingdom and rule over the whole earth. The key to distinguishing which event is being referred to in a particular scripture is to carefully discern to whom the scriptures are referring. If the scripture passage is clearly speaking of the church, the bride of Christ, then that verse is about the rapture. If the scripture passage is clearly speaking to Israel, then it refers to his second coming to set up his kingdom and rulership over all the earth, on the earth, his physical presence here on the earth, his millennial kingdom is setting, it, setting up as a millennial kingdom physically with his physical presence on the earth. And I, just this week studying this, got myself corrected. On just yesterday, or the day before, I guess, uh, that I, I've been using Matthew 24, 15 to 31 as a rapture test, a rapture text, but I was wrong. Verse 15 for the... Uh, Oh yeah, in verse 15, this is Matthew 24, 15. For the Antichrist to offer the sacrifice that defiles the temple, as Daniel prophesied, there must be a temple in Jerusalem. And the temple will not be built until after the church is removed and the Antichrist is revealed, and he, the Antichrist, makes a seven-year treaty with Israel. In verse 16, this is still Matthew 24, it definitely is directed to those who live in Judea, the Jews. So we know that this is a scripture referring to his second coming, setting up his millennial kingdom after, <clears throat> after the seven years of tribulation, the great tribulation. Uh, 
let's see, verses 30 and 31. Again, this is not the rapture because the sign of the Son of Man is seen by all people. The rapture, at the rapture when he comes as a thief in the night, no one sees his coming. There's no signs, there's no warning. He comes as a thief in the night without any, uh, any signs of his coming. Jesus, uh, verse 32, uh, again, we're still in Matthew 24. Jesus resumes his teaching about end times. And now this is a general statement. It's not specifically to Israel. He resumes his teaching about end times and tells us that the generation that sees the fig tree blossom will be the generation that sees all of these things come to pass. <clears throat> and then he cautions us to remain faithful servants who not, are not careless, who are not careless <clears throat> about their behavior and their assignments in his kingdom. Wow. Yeah, so important that we remain faithful servants because we do not know when he's coming. There are no prophetic scriptures that need to be fulfilled. There are no signs in the heavens that need to be fulfilled for us to know that he's coming. It will happen as the uh, uh, expression is, as a thief in the night. You won't know when, but he is coming. And what an uh, awesome encouragement to live in a righteous manner, to uh, be diligent about whatever your assignment is in the body of Christ, to be diligent in doing that, living it day by day, <clears throat> and being careful not to drift away from what your assignment is and drift away from walking in righteousness. You want to be one of his when he comes. And continuing in uh, Matthew 25 at verse 1 begins the story. Uh, now this is directed to the virgins, to the bride. And again, it contains another caution to be diligent, to be ready all the time for his coming in secret and unannounced. You need to be ready all the time. You need to uh, be continually filled with the, the oil of righteousness, with the oil of joy, with the oil of his presence. Uh, thank you, Lord, for <laughs> giving us these scriptures that caution us how we should be behaving. Okay, now let's go listen, look, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what I need. In John 14, and I'm going to read that, John 14, John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> and this is a, um, the Jewish people would recognize, I've only been told about this scripture, but the Jewish people would recognize this as part of Jewish wedding custom. The things he says here are uh, words and, th and uh, things that the uh, Jewish people would practice uh, at a wedding feast. So we know that we're talking about something about Jesus' return for his bride. Uh, John 14, verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This is something that after the bride price had been paid and uh, the groom would say these words to his future bride that he was coming back for her. I will go and prepare a place for you. I'll go and prepare a mansion and I will come back. That was his covenant promise to her that he would come back. That where I am in his uh, uh, in the house or the yeah in the house that he had built and prepared for her when he comes back he'll bring her unto himself he is coming back is his promise in my father's house are many mansions when the bridegroom <clears throat> after the bride price was paid and the a marriage was arranged the groom went back to his father's house on their estate, on their property, and began to prepare a house, a mansion, it, <laughs> uh, whatever was appropriate, and a place uh, where the bride and groom would spend seven days shut away together to consummate their marriage. <clears throat> And the groom could not go to pick up his bride to, to go and get her until the father said that it was finished. It was complete. Everything was ready. <clears throat> and he would say something to the groom, go and bring your bride home. And so that's what we're anticipating. Any time the father could say, it's enough. There's enough preparation. Go and bring your bride home. Hallelujah. So we're uh, expecting imminently the uh, Father to say to Jesus, It's time. Go bring your bride home. Wow. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to read 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. <clears throat> For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in God will bring with him. This we, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Old English word, will not precede them, will not get there first. And will not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. So we're waiting to hear the trumpet blast, the shofar blast. Uh, in Exodus 19:19, 19, 19, it talks of the God blowing his shofar to announce the, uh, uh, a call for the whole nation of Israel to assemble into his presence. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, 
the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet, with the shofar blast of the voice of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And <laughs> he's assuring them here that those who are dead in the Lord, their bodies will be raised to meet their souls in the air, and they will be there, all of this in a, uh, an incredibly short piece of time. Uh, I heard someone trying to explain, understand that, um, uh, went into a great deal of depth about uh, the, the expression, the twinkling of an eye. Really, it's talking about the smallest division of time that you can make so that it's not like you would, you know, kind of see me slowly drift away into the ceiling. I'd be gone. I'd be here one second and gone the next. And I said, <laughs> I hope that happens. <laughs> Well, we're on the air. <clears throat> and remember, we talked about the uh, resurrection of Jesus and how that was so important. Without the resurrection, there is no hope for us. The uh, uh, whole price for the... Uh, the whole price for our sin and our forgiveness has to has to have been paid, and the mark, the sign that it has been complete, was God raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Then, okay, in verse seventeen. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Caught up from the Greek word harpazo, meaning to seize or to catch away. And when the scriptures were translated to Latin, uh, the word that closest resembled that in the Latin is something like raptus. And it is the root we get our English word rapture. So that's what our, our word rapture comes from, even though it's not in any of our English translations, nor in the Greek. It's a, a Latin translation of the word <clears throat> meaning to be caught up, be snatched up, to hap something that happens very quickly. And we know that this is a scripture of the rapture because... Jesus doesn't come physically to the earth. He comes in the clouds, in the air. He doesn't come physically down to the earth. So this is one of those scriptures that you know for sure he's talking about the rapture of his bride, the church, because he doesn't come physically to the earth in this scripture. He meets, we meet him in the, in the air. So, you know, to understand that Jesus only comes physically down to earth to rule and reign from his throne in Jerusalem after the great tribulation of seven years. All the, uh, all the evil persons and things that offend are removed by the angels, and that's in Matthew 13:41. <clears throat> Thus, the millennial kingdom begins with only righteous people still having their atomic nature and their mortal bodies. Now there is, whenever there's a subject that's important, somebody makes it, uh, spells out a doctrine, <clears throat> and there is a, a doctrine called the doctrine of imminency. Uh, it simply means that no prophetic event has yet to be fulfilled before the rapture can occur. Whenever the Father is satisfied that all the preparations and mansions are ready, 
he will say to Jesus, the son, go, my son, and bring your bride home. Wow. We so, so want that imminency. Everything about the second coming of Jesus, we have scriptures, a whole lot of them have yet to be fulfilled. And we know that it's not imminent because it's at least seven years away because the seven years of tribulation have to happen before Jesus returns physically to this earth to set up his kingdom. So we know <coughs> that uh, uh, the second coming is not imminent because we know there are events that must yet take place. Time must pass. But the rapture of the church could happen while I'm speaking. It's imminent. And because it says it so well, I'm going to read... The, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. You can find this online if you go search for the doctrine of imminency. That's I M M I N E N C Y. Imminency and the any moment rapture. This is from a uh, uh, Thomas Ice. At Liberty, at Liberty University. So you can look that up online if you wanted to reread it. <clears throat> but it's just so good, I'm just going to read the whole thing. <clears throat> Imminency and the Any Moment Rapture by Thomas Ice. We will believe that our Lord and Savior Jesus could come in the clouds at any moment and take his church to be with him to his father's house. What a great hope that while, we were re while you are reading this article, our Lord could return and rapture his church. We have come to call this any moment hope of the rapture an imminent event. The English word imminent of Latin derivation can be used in many ways it is, it is used to note the New Testament teaching that Christ could return and rapture his church at any moment without prior signs or warning. Use of the term imminency entered the lexicon of the American evangelicalism around the end of the last century in contrast to the dominant and post-millennialism <clears throat> oh, that's a hard word. Uh, I'll be go back. Use of the term Im imminency entered the lect lexicon of American evangelicalism around the end of the last century in contrast to the dominate, dominant but waning post-millennialism that taught Christ's coming was not imminent. Post-millennialism held that Christ's return must first await for the Christianization of the world by the church. By the 1930s, it was common to pack into one theological expression, imminency, and all of the many New Testament ways in which Christ's coming for his church is said to be possible at any moment. Thus, imminency and the any moment return of Christ became synonyms for the pre-tribulation rapture of his church. In fact, imminency is such a powerful argue, <clears throat> excuse me, and, excuse me. <clears throat> In fact, imminency is such a powerful argument for pre-tribulationism that it is one of the most frequent and fiercely attacked doctrines by our opponents. Non-pre-tribulationists sense that if the New Testament teaches imminency, then pre-tribulationism is virtually assured. And that is quite a 
theological argument that goes on way above my head. I <clears throat> anyway, definition of imminency. What is the biblical definition of imminency? Four important elements contribute to a pre-tribulational understanding of imminency. First, imminency means that the rapture could take place at any moment. While other events may take place before the rapture, no event must precede it. If prior events are required before the rapture, then the rapture could not be described as imminent. Thus, if, if any event were required to occur before the rapture, then the concept of imminency would be destroyed. Second, since the rapture is imminent and could happen at any moment, then it follows that one must be prepared for it to occur at any time without sign or warning. Third, imminency eliminates any attempt at date setting. Date setting is impossible since the rapture is signless, that is, providing no basis for debts, date setting. And if imminency is really true, oh, just a minute. If imminency is really true, the moment a date was fixed, then Christ could not come at any moment, destroying imminency. Fourth, Reynolds Showers says, a person cannot legitimately say that an imminent event will happen soon. The term, term soon implies that an event must take place within a short time after a particular point in time specified or implied. By contrast, an imminent event may take place within a short time, but it does not have to do so in order to be imminent. As, hope, as I hope by now you can see, imminent is not equal to soon. A.T. Pearson has noted that imminence is the combination of two conditions, certainty and uncertainty. By an imminent event, we mean one which could occur at some time, but uncertain at what time. Imminency in the New Testament. The fact that Christ could return, but may not soon at any moment, yet without... <coughs> I'm sorry. <clears throat> the fact that Christ could return, but may not soon at any moment, yet without the necessity of signs preceding his return, requires the kind of imminence taught by pre-tribulationism. What New Testament passages teach this truth? Those verses stating that Christ could return at any moment without warning, and those instructing believers to wait and look for the Lord's coming to teach the doctrine of imminence. Note the following New Testament passages. And there's a huge list of scriptures here. Um, I'll just read a few of them. Um, then later, uh, when the uh, video is posted online, <clears throat> In the comments, uh, I'll list all these scriptures so that you can look them up for yourself. But 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, Maranatha. Philippians 3, 20, our <clears throat> we eagerly await for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, verse 5, the Lord is near. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 10, to wait for his Son from heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, but this we say by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, and we read that scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. 1 Timothy 6.14. Um, For let you keep, keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 9.28, so Christ shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. James 5, 7 to 9, Be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Therefore the judge is standing right at the door. 1 Peter 1, 13, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jude 21, Waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, to eternal life. Revelation 3:11, 22:7, uh, 22:12 and 20. I am coming quickly, Jesus said. <clears throat> Revelation uh, yeah, 22:17, then 20. And the Spirit and the Bride say, "Come," and let the one who hears say, "Come." He who testifies to these things saying, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. It is significant that all the above passages relate to the rapture and speak to the Lord's coming as something that occurred, could occur at any moment. That is, it is imminent. <clears throat> this is why believers are waiting for a person Jesus Christ, not just an event or series of events such as those related to the tribulation leading up to Christ's second advent in which he returns to the earth and remains in his millennial reign. Imminence and pre-tribulationism. Contemplation of the above passages indicate that Christ may come at any moment so that the rapture is actually imminent. Only pre-tribulationism can give us a full literal meaning to such an any moment event. Other rapture views must redefine imminence more loosely than the New Testament would allow. Dr. Valford declares the exhortation to look for Tribulation must intervene first. <clears throat> Believers in that case should look for signs. If the signs related to the events of the tribulation, that is, Antichrist, the two witnesses, etc., and not, uh, excuse me, but the New Testament, as demonstrated above, uniformly instructs the church to look for the coming of Christ, while tribulation saints are told to look for signs. The New Testament exhortation to be con <clears throat> excuse me, the New, <laughs> New Testament exhortation to be comfort comforted by the Lord's coming, John 14, 1, and Thess 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, would no longer have any meaning if believers first had to pass through any part of the tribulation. Instead, comfort would have to await the passages through the events of tribulation. No, the church has been given a blessed hope, in part because of our Lord's return is imminent. Maranatha. And with this we will end the early church had a special greeting for one another as recorded in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, which was Maranatha. Maranatha consists of three Aramaic, Aramaic words, Mar, meaning Lord, Ana, Our, and Ta, Come, meaning Our Lord, Come. As with other New Testament passages, Maranatha only makes sense if in any moment or imminent coming is understood. Such an understanding supports the pre-tribulationism. No wonder these ancient Christians coined such a unique greeting 
which reflects an eager expectation of the blessed hope and as a very real presence in their everyday lives provided a motivation for godly living, evangelism, and worldwide evangelism. The life of the church today could only be improved if Maranatha were to return as a sincere greeting on the lips of expectant peoples. Maranatha. Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. I trust and hope <laughs> that out of all of that you got uh, some uh, hope and encouragement that nothing is left except the pr uh, coming of Jesus in the air for his bride. No other event, nothing prophesied, nothing is required. The the rapture can occur even as we're speaking. So what, a, what an awesome way to be encouraged uh, to stay in a righteous relationship with the Lord Jesus, to keep busy about doing whatever your assignment in the body of Christ is. Keep doing what... He has directed you to do and keep looking up. That is our whole hope, our blessed hope, that we will not experience the tribulation, will not experience anything of his judgment. We will be caught away. We will be raptured in a moment in the blink <laughs> twinkling of an eye will rise to meet him in the air and be with him forever. I trust that you are encouraged and built up and this is your hope that you will be one of his when he comes back. So be careful, be diligent to Remain in a right standing with him, in relation with him and with the Father. Did you have anything, Ray? Good news, Ralph. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus is, is good coming. News? Jesus is coming. That's good news. That's good news, eh? Are Are you ready? I believe I am. Well, you are. <laughs> okay. You don't have to believe. You are. <laughs> you are because the I is, I am, is in you. Amen. And the uh, Holy Spirit. So if you have any doubt in your mind that you're not ready, uh, the blood of Jesus, you know, the blood of Jesus that paid all the price for your sin has made you ready Amen. if you have come to a place and surrendered. So Amen. I think that's a good thing for people to surrender. Amen. And it says Revelations 12, 11. What's that, how do, what's that scripture say? Uh, oh, the, the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They love not the, their lives. Unto the death. Unto the death. Is that uh, resurrection life death or is that? Uh, yeah, it's resurrection life. Amen. Well, yeah, because uh, there's no, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know that scripture, so you're going to hell. Ap <laughs> Apathetesco. You're going the wrong way. You need to do a U turn. Amen. You need to repent. And Apathetesco is resurrection life, everlasting life. Amen. John 11 25 says, um, if you believe, I think Jesus said, um, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you shall not die. Amen. So that Amen. means you got resurrection life now and forevermore. Amen. Your postal code may change. Your your body may change, but your spirit does not, and your soul goes to heaven. Amen. 
Isn't that what the Father wants? Amen. Did, oh, he, want, yes. did he not want that in the garden? Absolutely. He wanted us to live there forever in his presence. So this is nothing more than a U-turn to repent and get out of the kingdom of this world or hell and come into the kingdom of heaven that's invading earth. Amen. And say, here I am. Here, here. I surrender. I, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And, you, and that testimony is that you come and you repent of your sins and you give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Testimony. Hmm. You know, Revelation 19.10 is good too. It says, the spirit of prophecy hmm. is the testimony of Jesus. Amen. Were you preaching some prophetic prophecy saying, Jesus is coming back. He's returning. Absolutely. That's what all of these seven things were about. Yes. Did you get the memo? Yeah. <laughs> hit, boom, I hit I, I just hit the button. Did you get the memo? That Jesus is returning. Amen. And he's coming back for his bride that is a beautiful bride. I mean I look good. I'm yeah. a beautiful bride. <laughs> he's getting rid of all the stinky out of me. Amen. Getting all the wrinkles out of me and you. Amen. And all the spots. Amen. Blemishes. So mm. the reason I'm saying this is I have a testimony. Amen. All you that have been praying for my brother, at 1.39 today, he, him and Brenda came out of the uh, consultation uh, of the last, I'm going to get, either going to cut this cancer out, hmm. this is it, because he's already had two other tests with surgeons saying we have to cut it out, we have to cut it out in the last uh, three weeks. They did more tests. And what did we pray, Ralph? What did we pray for our brother based on the meeting that he was having today? Total healing. That they would not require surgery. They would find nothing left of the cancer. We were praying like that. So was that a prophetic prayer? Was that, was that a prayer of faith? Or was that saying the blood of Jesus heals? Well, it was a prophetic prayer because we were declaring what we believed would happen, and it happened. And it was faith. We just got we just got the we just got the memo from Brenda and Doug, and he phoned me and said, "What a happy guy!" Amen. Because he was there. When he went up to the conference in uh, Vernon, and people praying. He was touched. But all the prayers, like for the last six months in this whole thing, mm -hmm. and the faith that him and Brenda had, and the faith that you've had. Standing in the gap and praying for my brother, bless you. But there's many more out there. That, there's many more to pray for. Amen. Many more to pray for. Leslie, is there anybody else that we need to pray for right now? You're deep in prayer. Yeah. Oh, she's giving me a wave. She's heavy in the anointing. So if there's anybody out there that needs to be touched by the Lord Jesus Christ and says, um, will, is, it, is it God's will or desire to heal me? Absolutely. Amen. Here it is. Do you have the faith to say, yes, here I am, Lord. Heal me from mm -hmm. the inside out, outside in. Mm -hmm. So we just pray that anointing, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. As it says, by his stripes you are healed. And I thank you, Lord, that for all those that are going through any physical situation that they need mm. um, healing for. And you've got, you've got testimony in your own body that God's doing. Yes. I've got testimony in my body. And all for those that may be going through um, trauma or discouragement or disillusionment. May the Lord heal all those um, difficulties that you're mm. going through because many of us are going through many trials and tribulations. <laughs> yeah. Is a tribulation final? No. Oh. No. But it's something we have to go through. Well, if we can avoid it, we'll do that first. But In other words, if you see a storm coming, can you go around it? Or pray for the storm to divide and go around you. Ah, I've seen, done that and, and seen it happen. We've seen that in Fiji. Yeah. We've seen it in different places. So you have the authority in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all things are under your feet, as it mm -hmm. says in Ephesians 1, 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. And in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, it says, Jesus gave everything to us. Amen. What does everything mean? All power. All dominion, in all. Authority. 
Are you walking in the all in all? Amen. Amen. So, yeah, I had a little bit to say. <laughs> I'm excited about for my brother. Amen. I'm excited for Brenda. I'm excited for all those who have been praying for this miracle yes. for the last six months. I'm excited for the fact that we're up in Vernon. And while we're, he was up there at the conference with us in Vernon, and with that last song, you know, um, you know, it was all about the Holy Spirit, and it was all about. We, I went, and the Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit says, prompted me to go put my arm around my brother, and we sang that beautiful hymn together, mm. and, and both of us crying. Mm. Is there anything better that on earth? Amen. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as it is in heaven, God wants to heal us. Amen. He wants the Father in heaven wants a relationship with us through the Son, hmm. through the blood of the Son. We need hmm. to come to a place and bow down and repent us. And then the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead in Romans 8 11, it what? It occupies us. Mm -hmm. It habitates in us. It becomes part of us. Amen. Does the Holy Spirit have any less power than Jesus no. or the Father? In fact, it says that Spirit that lives in us, that raised Jesus from the dead, lives in us. <clears throat> so that means the Trinity, all the things that the Trinity is, resides in us. Yes, absolutely. And the Father's omnipresence is around us. Amen. And the blood is over us. Yes. Did you get the memo? Yeah. <laughs> Resurrection life. That's Amen. what we. That's what the Lord gave us this name like thirty some odd years ago. Amen. And we've been walking in that revelation since that time. When I say that, we get more revelation all the time. But yeah. we had the revelation to start there, yeah. and God has just given us more of it. So you've got to start somewhere to get a revelation. Amen. And when you get the revelation, God will continue to grow the revelation in you. Amen. About your relationship with the Father, about mm. your relationship with Jesus, with both the relationship with the Holy Spirit, and your relationship with those in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. you, you've got to have relationship. Amen. We come, you know, Ralph has been teaching and preaching the Word of God for uh, a number of weeks, but there's seven terrific topics and points. Go back and study it. Two weeks, uh, we go into some more, diff you know, as far as uh, the ark is concerned, resurrection life, apostolic resurrection life center. Um, it's exciting to do more teaching. Amen. But it's more exciting for those who receive the teaching and go out and walk in it. Yes. And that's what this is all about. It's not for you to become to a place of stale manna, but living word, living life, living bread, living streams of water coming mm. out of you. Amen. So this is nothing but preparation for you to go out and go through the storms. Yes. And not let the storms go through you. Amen. Because you, who, who's the storm master? In the word of God, the storm master is, is Abba, Father, is Amen. Yahweh. Yes. So if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead and all things were given to us, that means we can become not only glory carriers, but we can be the storm master against the storms coming in your life or anybody else's life. Amen. And pray through them, about them, Amen. and destroy the storms in Jesus' name. Not in your power. Not in any ministry that we have, or what this ministry is, or the church name. It's in Him and Him Amen. alone. And the Father and the Holy Spirit. So, in saying that, Rosh Hashanah tomorrow. Yes. A new beginning, 5783. Be here at 1042 3rd in yeah. Carberry. 1010. 10 stands for order. order. Yep. 10 stands for testimony. More testimony, testimony t tomorrow. So the Lord bless you guys. Thank you for praying for my brother and praying for others. We've got a lot of prayer requests. Send them in by email or send them in online. And the Lord heal you and but may give you joy. Yes. Joy in the midst of the storm because you are the you are the delight. You are the delight and the precious, precious 
son or daughter of the Most High. The devil brings a storm just to get you to a place to have a nice spiritual shower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wash off the storm. Because the storm can't wash off you. Amen. So, Amen. did I have a little bit to say? Was that a little bit? That was a little bit. That was really Was good. a testimony good? Yes. More testimony tomorrow? So I'll just let you... Um, bring this to a conclusion there pastor ralph mm -hmm. yeah well we'll close as we always do with the ironic blessing yes because it is just so precious yes. that god instructed moses to have this prayer prayed over his people every single day the lord bless you Amen. and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you Thank you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, you and grant you shalom, peace. his peace, and place his names upon you. Jehovah Tzidkenu, the yeah. Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Mm -hmm. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Mm -hmm. And Jehovah Shalom, the Lord's peace. Huh. Amen. Amen. And, and we and, really do love you out there. So I'll let you go push the button. And I'll keep smiling at these people. Thumbs up. Praise the Lord. All those from the nations are getting... Oh, one more testimony. What is that? Another testimony. Uh, Christopher Mamalima from uh, Malawi. Uh, just his visa and everything. He's coming from Malawi. He's got the, They fingerprinted him and they're sending him here for the conference October 26th to November 8th. So he's the first one that's been approved that we know of. And there could be about eight to ten more. So we'll see how the Lord does that. And there's people from across Canada coming. So get your tickets. Amen. Book online. Or give us a call and reserve your tickets because we have room for about a hundred people per day. So bless you. Be part of that 100. Amen.